So, now I'm going to show you how to implement MIP mapping in an actual 3D game engine using OpenGL. And you can download the 3D game engine both before and after we implement the MIP mapping code in the description. And the build instructions are in the readme file. So, anyways, now let's go to texture.h and texture.cpp because unsurprisingly, our whole MIP mapping system is going to have a lot to do with the texture. Fortunately for us, though, the graphics card actually has support for selecting which MIP map to use in the graphics hardware, because this is a pretty common technique. Or at least, if your graphics card doesn't, OpenGL masks it for you. So, we can actually do a lot of the work of selecting which MIP map to use and all that stuff with OpenGL. All we really have to do is supply the MIP maps. So, here's what I'm going to do. In this function, texture data colon colon init textures, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an if statement. And basically, this is going to test if we want MIP mapping to be used for this texture. And you might be wondering, well, how on earth am I going to know whether this texture is using MIP mapping or not? And actually, there's a very easy way to tell. The way you tell OpenGL that, hey, this is something that uses MIP mapping and you should use the graphics hardware to select the appropriate MIP mapped texture for this, that's actually part of the filter. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an if statement. It's going to say if the filter, or filters, sub i, so the filter for whatever texture we're at in this loop, is equal to gl underscore nearest MIP map nearest. That's one of the possible options for enabling MIP mapping. There's actually four of these, so I'm going to copy and paste. Whoops, not five, there's only four. So yeah, there's options for enabling MIP mapping with nearest filtering and with linear filtering. And there's also one more option where you can do MIP map underscore linear. You can actually apply filtering to the way it selects a MIP map. And we're going to talk about that in a moment, but for now, all we need to know is that these are the options. <laughs> but yeah. So, if they've selected one of these options, that means, hey, we're using MIP mapping. So, what we need to do is we need to just supply the MIP maps, and OpenGL is just going to do the rest. Fortunately, though, OpenGL makes supplying the MIP maps incredibly easy. As a function, GL generate MIP map, which will generate all the MIP maps you need for a texture. That's pretty convenient. And we need to specify GL texture underscore 2D, because it, these are 2D textures. The only other thing is, I'm going to have an else clause to this, and else these two lines of code. These, these are two lines of code we already had, and basically what they mean is, we aren't, we don't have any MIP maps for the texture. So yeah. So if we do have MIP maps, we're going to generate them, Otherwise, we're going to tell OpenGL we don't have any. And there. The only other, other thing I want to change is in my texture. I want the texture to default to using MIP maps. So, in my constructor line here, where GL float filter equals GL linear, I'm going to change that to linear underscore MIP map nearest. And same thing for the other constructor for texture. So, as long as we haven't specified otherwise, we're going to default to using MIP maps for the texture. Great, so now all I should have to do is build, and we should be using MIP maps for our textures. So yeah, let's wait for this thing to build, and let's run. Okay. Well, clearly I've done something wrong, because this shouldn't be happening. And it was something very, very simple. You see, if you want OpenGL to generate MIP maps, you need to actually, you know, submit the texture data before that. So you'll want to move this GL text image 2D call to above this whole thing where we're setting up MIP maps and such. So if you do that, build and run, then, hey, look, we've got MIP maps working. So I can zoom out, and you notice the cube isn't breaking down anymore, so that's good. But also you might notice the transition is a little bit sudden, and I don't know if this plane's big enough to show it, but, um, well, you can kind of see it. 
there's sort of a pretty visible boundary between where there's no MIP mapping and there's MIP mapping. So OpenGL offers a solution to this, actually. Here's the thing. What you can do is you can not just sample from the nearest MIP map, but you can sample from the two nearest MIP maps and basically just linear and linearly interpolate between whatever value you get from those two MIP maps based on, you know, which, which one's closer to which. And that's what happens when you use the GL MIP map, GL linear MIP map linear function. So, yeah. And this is sometimes called trilinear filtering because you're both doing, you're doing linear filtering on the x-axis of the texture, the y-axis of the texture, and along the MIP mapping levels. So, yeah, three-way linear filtering. And now if you zoom out, you notice there's much less popping. It's very, very smooth transitions between the MIP maps and such. As you zoom out, and the only real thing is, well, things look okay when you zoom out just looking straight down, but if you look at it at an angle, well, things look a little bit odd. It looks really blurred. It looks like there's just not a lot of detail there. And that is one consequence of using bitmaps like this. But again, there's a solution to this. Now, the way the texture starts to blur in the distance is an artifact of the way MIP mapping works. Now, the thing is with MIP mapping, you're always approximating a square area. When I downsample the texture to half its size, that's every pixel represents a 2x2 two two square in the original texture. The quarter size MIP map, every pixel represents a 4x4 four four square in the original texture, all right? So the only sample areas you really have with MIP mapping are squares. And you know, that works great if you're looking straight down because it is a square and everything looks amazing. When you start looking at an angle though, well, all of a sudden the surface you're drawing is no longer a square. And now MIP mapping isn't mapping very well to well to this whole thing anymore because, well, we're not drawing a square, we're drawing a very shallow angled thing. <laughs> and that's not ideal. Ideally, we'd be have some way to resample the MIP map, not so that we're always uniformly sampling just the square that best approximates it, mates it, but rather we take several samples from several different MIP maps to try and sort of approximate the the shape that it needs to be. So in this case, it needs to be a trapezoid. So ideally, we'd tr sample a few squares here to try and approximate a trapezoid shape in our sampling, if that makes any sense. And that is the idea of anisotropic filtering. And if it seems a little vague to you, don't worry. That's because it is a little vague. OpenGL specifies absolutely nothing about how the anisotropic filtering should work, other than <laughs> it shouldn't sample in a uniform square, basically. So anything that doesn't do, do that qualifies as some form of anisotropic filtering. And indeed, anisotropic filtering works quite differently between different graphics cards. So I can't go into much more detail because more detail means talking about how a specific graphic card implements this. But they're all trying to do the same thing. They're trying to sample in an area that's not a square, so that, you know, you don't have these weird blurring in the background. So yeah. Now here's how you enable it. It's actually very, very easy to enable. In texture.cpp, where we're generating the bitmap, all you have to do is use yet another GL text param f. So I'm just going to copy and paste that line. And by the way, that reminds me, I really shouldn't be hard coding GL texture 2D here. should probably be, you know, putting in whatever they passed in as a texture target. So let's fix that. It has nothing to do with anisotropic filtering, it's just something I noticed. So yeah. And it's called GL underscore texture underscore, of course, and then underscore max 
Oh, you already selected it for me. <laughs> Max anisotropy underscore ext. And that's the way we can control this. Now, here's the thing. Since OpenGL is very vague on how exactly anisotropic filtering should work, the only parameter we have control over is the maximum number of samples used for anisotropic filtering per pixel. So, for instance, if I set this to 8.0f, then that means that the graphics card is going to use, at a maximum, not always, but at a maximum, it's going to use 8 samples per pixel to approximate whatever shape it deems appropriate for anisotropic filtering. And since this is so graphics card dependent, your, your scene might look a little bit different after this, but if you build and run, you might see some, well, nice looking anisotropic filtered textures in the distance. So we have the benefits of all the, the you know, all the trilinear filtering looking nice and making things look good, and anisotropic filterings making things look nice even at weird angles like this. That's probably gonna... It does start to break down a little bit again if you get a really shallow angle, but that's pretty good. And this might not have worked at all for you, because the, ma the maximum amount you support also varies depending on graphics card. Of course. So what you'll probably want to do is want to have GL float. I'm going to call max anisotropy. Sure. And we can ask the graphics card, what's the maximum amount of anisotropic filtering you support? Oh, and it helps I spell anisotropy, right? <laughs> there we go, much better. And we can do this by gl git float v. And first we specify what we want to get from the graphics card, and then where to store it. So I want gl max texture max anisotropy extension. So this is the maximum this is the maximum maximum texture anisotropy, if that makes any sense. And we can store that in max anisotropy. So there. And if you want, you can just pass this in directly. So I think my graphics card supports a maximum of 16 anisotropic samples per pixel. So if I build and run, yeah, we have some very very nice and crisp looking textures in the distance. Even at ridiculous angles. <laughs> so yeah. And if you like, what you can do is you can clamp this. I have a clamp function in math3d.inch. So I'm going to clamp it. This works just like the GLSL clamp function. You specify the minimum and maximum and what you want to clamp it to. So I'll clamp it between 0.0f and 8.0f. And, oh, apparently I don't have math3d.h included here. Well, okay, I can include it. So, math3d.h. Build and run. And now it's clamped it to 8, so it should start... Yeah, should start seeing the artifacts again at that angle. And anyway, those are just some tools you can use to play around with that. So yeah, that's how you can properly filter textures and eliminate anti-aliasing artifacts. But there's one more thing I'd like to talk about before we go. You might have noticed that this variable, or all these variables for anisotropic filtering, end in underscore ext. And that means extension. So this is an extension to OpenGL. This is not a core part of OpenGL functionality. And this may not be supported in certain OpenGL versions. Or, well, you know, not, not OpenGL versions, but you know. Certain implementations of OpenGL might not support this feature at all. That said, just about every implementation of OpenGL since 1999 has supported this, so... You're probably not going to run into any issues with this. This is probably, in fact, this is one of two extensions that I'd say is safe to use without even a second thought. I'd say this and probably the S3TC, I believe it's called, Texture Compression, probably also safe to use. They're just about ubiquitously supported. You might be wondering, well, if they're so well supported, why isn't it a core part of OpenGL functionality? And the answer for both of them is the same thing. Intellectual property. Some company somewhere has 
declared some patent on these technologies, and therefore OpenGL can't officially incorporate it as a core part of the functionality or patent royalties and all that nonsense. So, yeah, that's why. <laughs> but, yeah, so this is safe to use, I think. It's one of two that I say is safe. I jam. So with that, folks, we have saved... Well, I say saved. We have figured out how to get nice, good-looking anti-alias textures, you know, without... without having some weird jaggedness in the... in the back... Yeah. Without some weird jaggedness in the distance, and also without any weird blurring in the distance. So textures look pretty nice. They're nice and anti-aliased. In fact, the only big aliasing artifact we really see anymore is the edges. The edges of polygons. And this is the point where polygon edge anti-aliasing becomes significant. And that's why I didn't cover it first, because we've, an, we've eliminated just about, well, yeah, just about all the aliasing artifacts just by properly filtering textures. So yeah, in the next video, we're going to talk about properly anti-aliasing polygons. So thank you, hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and I'll see you then.